Hey, hello everybody, and I'd like to welcome you all to the first edition of the Cemetery Podcast. I am your host, Ken Nagley from the Necro Tourist, and I think we got a lot of exciting things coming up today. We are going to be discussing one of Ohio's Garden Park Cemeteries. We are going to be discussing one of the famous Necro Tourism graves of all time. We are going to be visiting a Native American mound. We are going to visit an impressive cemetery monument. We are going to be discussing cemetery symbols. We are also going to be giving cemetery tips. And we are going to be telling you one of the scariest stories in the history of cemetery photography. Stick around. This is the Cemetery Podcast. For more photos and information to accompany this broadcast, go to thenecrotourist.com or thefuneralsource.org backslash cemetery dash podcast. All right, I want to open up this segment talking about a cemetery I visited almost a year ago, and it is located in Springfield, Ohio. We were there on the uh, day of the Super Bowl, as a matter of fact. I was there with Wendy Everett from the Graveyard Gals. We headed into Springfield and a few other areas in Clark County, but we headed to the Fern Cliff Cemetery and Arboretum. For those of you who have not been there, it's definitely one of those ones that needs to be checked out. Now, one of the coolest things about it is as you're entering into the cemetery, it's adjacent to a park which coincides with the uh, creek that runs along the entrance to the cemetery. And it has a huge uh, rock face area, which I'm sure is the reason why it's called Fern Cliff. But it, it's very interesting on the entrance. Again, as I mentioned to you, Fern Cliff is located in Springfield, Ohio. It has approximately about 150,000 burials. It was established in 1863 with only 70 acres, but it is now expanded to 240 acres. Some of the features that are there is the uh, pet cemetery and crematory. They also have the soldier circle, which was pretty cool. There is uh, 208 Civil War soldiers there, and all those guys had to be uh, the equivalent of honorably discharged, which was called the Diploma of Patriotism. Also in that area, there is uh, four cannons around, and there is a nine-foot statue that was done by Henry Lowe, but oddly enough, it's based on one of the Baileys of Barnum and Bailey fame. So, interesting fact about that statue uh, next time you pay a visit. One of the things that I found a little interesting about it was when you get down to the lake in the front near some of the uh, bigger mausoleums, you see a plaque which is dedicated to the people who designed the cemetery itself, and they are students of Adolf Strach, which is the guy that helped lay out the way Spring Grove and several of the other garden park cemeteries around the Midwest. You know, there's uh, quite a few famous burials there. One of the ones we went there for was the the pro boxer, uh, Davey Moore. He was uh, known back in the day as the Springfield Rifle. There is actually a song called Who Killed Davey Moore written by Bob Dylan. Check it out. Also, uh, Johnny Little, who was a jazz vibraphonist, He's buried there. Also, Bradley Kincaid, who was a folk singer and radio personality from the area. Also, one of my personal favorites was Brooks the Bull Lawrence, who was a pitcher for our hometown Cincinnati Reds during the late 50s and early 60s. He pitched for seven seasons, and he is a member of the Reds Hall of Fame. Also, you'll find Patty Parks there, who was a Jonestown murder victim. James Schlesinger, yes, you political junkies, it's that James Schlesinger, the one who was the U.S. Secretary of Defense who served under Nixon and Ford. But the biggest gun and one of the biggest reasons we went to that cemetery was for Ohio's 40th governor, Asa Bushnell. He is also the founder of International Harvester. But if you go to visit, you cannot miss his Uh, mausoleum. It is open-aired, huge, white. Uh, You can look through all of the uh, burial stones are laid out of all the family members. It literally looks like a little 
outdoor building rather than it does an actual mausoleum. You know, if you do go there, you are able to uh, visit their online grave search if you're looking for people. They also have maps of the cemetery online. And I am going to suggest that if you are in and around the central Ohio area, that you definitely need to make a pit stop at the Ferncliff Cemetery. You will be glad you did. Hey, here's a travel tip from us at the Necro Tourist. I don't know if you're like us, but we drink a lot of coffee. And you know when you check into a hotel room, they usually have those little mini coffee makers where they give you two pouches of regular coffee and two pouches of decaf. Well, be sure when you check in at the hotel that you ask them for extra ones at the counter. Then, if you happen to leave to go out to dinner or whatever and you stop back at the counter, ask them for a few more. Hopefully you have six to seven, eight. Then you are able to make multiple cups of coffee and in the event that you don't use them all, you can always put them in a Ziploc baggie and bring them with you so that the next time you visit a hotel, you'll actually have extra ones ahead of the game. But be sure you always ask when checking in. That's a tip from the Necro Tourist. Hello, boys and girls. And today's cemetery symbolism is the lily. Lilies have been around and are associated with the beginning of time and are also associated with the divinity. And they are abundant in funerary arts. And they stand for innocence and purity. Yes, lilies were connected with funerals in ancient Rome and in Egypt. And each type of lily has a slightly different meaning, like the Easter lily being associated with resurrection and innocence of the soul, the calla lily being associated with marriage and fidelity, as well as its majestic beauty, and the lily of the valley, innocence, humility, and renewal, also called the steps to heaven. And they were used widely till the end of the Victorian era for their fragrance, which they had their magic ability to cover up the smells of the dead. The water lily represented purity and sanctity in the East. Now, the cup or the calyx of the lily can represent spiritual vessel from which the divine is born. Resurrection plus renewal as it emerges in the spring. It's highly regenerative and lilies can rebound from fire and drought, which is why they have that association. The lily has been described as being eternal and incorruptible. It represents purity, immortality, virginity, and majesty. Hey, would you like your cemetery conservation done with respect and honor? Then contact our friends at Moscow Cemetery Monument Repair. With 23 years of practicing conservation, Robert Mosco is a third generation historical mason. He also holds a master's degree in historical preservation and has conserved more than 89 cemeteries and worked on more than 8,000 gravestones and monuments. He does practice a do no harm method and all of the work is documented and photographed. You can check them out at CemeteryRepair.com. Again, that's Moscow Cemetery Monument Repair. Hey, welcome back. Hey, right now I'd like to tell you about one of the top 10 necrotourism destinations in the United States. I'd like to share a little bit of history, but I'd also like to tell you a little bit about my adventure there in 2019. The place that I am talking about is none other than Mount Vernon, the burial location of the first president of the United States, George Washington. George Washington died in January of 1799. And when Washington died, the Congress passed a resolution that they wanted to bury the first president in a crypt that was going to be two stories below the rotundra in the Capitol that was actually under construction at that time. Martha Washington thought it was a good idea, and she agreed with it as well. So while the construction was going on, Washington was placed in the family tomb, as were approximately 20 other members of the Washington family. 
Now, George Washington himself requested in his will that the family build a more elaborate tomb than the older tomb that they had overlooking the river. As a matter of fact, to quote him, the family vault at Mount Vernon requiring repairs and being improperly situated besides, I desire that a new one of brick and upon a larger scale may be built at the foot of what is commonly called the vineyard enclosure. And again, that was in his will. So, around 1830, it was the 100th centennial of George Washington's birthday. So, conversation was taking place again about having him buried in the rotunda of the Capitol, but again, that never happened. But another thing happened in 1830 was the Washington vault was vandalized and broken into when these were trying to get the skull of George Washington. Yes, you heard what I said, trying to get the skull of George Washington. Well, their plan failed because they ended up with the skull of his grandfather. After that happened, the grandson of George Washington, uh, John Washington, decided to go ahead and build the tomb, or the vault rather, that we all see now, the family vault. So the Washingtons and the rest of the family were moved to this new grand uh, brick enclosed vault in 1831. Now the sarcophagi that the Washingtons are in now were installed in 1837 and their bodies were placed inside. Now as you approach the main vault, there are two obelisks that are enclosed by black fences. Those are actually the markers for John Washington and his wife, as I mentioned, who was the grandson of George Washington, who actually had the vault built. Now, one of the other things that's on the grounds of the Mount Vernon estate is the slave cemetery. Uh, the slave cemetery is interesting because there's several few things on that. Number one, there is a slave marker that identifies, this was done in uh, 1929. This was a slave marker that recognized all the slaves that were buried from 1760 up until 1860 during that time period. Well, later on, excavations were done in that slave cemetery. And in 1983, uh, researchers uh, did more research and created a marker on the burial grounds. So the uh, slave cemetery is a separate entity in of itself and needs to be checked out as well while you're on the Mount Vernon estate. Now, part of what I was mentioning about the marker that was put there for the slaves in 1929, that was done by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Now, they're a very important organization because once upon a time, the Washington family fell on hard times, that is. And in 1838, the Ladies Association purchased the property that is the Vernon estate, or Vernon Manor is, had it restored and then allows it to be what it is and operates the things that go on now. As a matter of fact, they have tours there every day of the year, a tradition that was actually started by George Washington himself, daily tours being available at Mount Vernon. Now, obviously, there's lots of things you can check out on the estate, you know, the slaves' quarters, the actual house itself. You can go on guided tours. You know, of course, knowing what I do with the necrotourism, I was more concerned with the cemeteries and the burial areas. Mount Vernon was put on the National Historic Landmark list in 1960, and it became on the National Registry of Historic Places in 1966. You know, it uh, costs about $25 to get in, and if you are able to visit, it is definitely worth your time in a necro-tourist destination that definitely needs to be visited.